And um, Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I teach both, and um, it is, it's really easy to confuse the two. And if you're going into nursing, you're going to need APA. And if you're going into ML, into anything in the humanities, you're, or probably business, you're going to need MLA. So let me just start. Okay. Okay. So first, MLA stands for Modern Language Association, and APA stands for American Psychological Association. MLA is the oldest by a lot. It's over 100 years old. APA is, has been around a while, but it's only been in the uh, citation business for about 30 years. Okay, so why MLA and why APA? So in MLA, it's standard for the humanities and just about everything else. And most people in high school learn MLA because the citations are taught by English teachers, and English teachers know MLA. APA is the standard in business and medicine and social science and all the sciences and kind of like intensely career related field. So that's kind of the, the reasoning. All right, next step. Both of them important because they give the paper credibility, right? If you don't have a citation, nobody knows that they can trust what you're saying. They don't know where you got it. And it also makes the, the work like more comfortable. I'm going to believe you. I'm going to not worrying about where you got your stuff if you're following MLA or APA. Okay, so MLA and APA both expect in-text citation and references. If you don't follow one or the other in a research setting, it's plagiarism. That's probably the most important thing about all of this. Okay, so oh, there's a little bit of different logic for MLA, the people in the humanities, the author's name is the most important. That's what gives it validity. So you're going to see the author's name in the citations more prominently. In APA, they're all about the sciences, and so they worry more about when something was published because they worry about something's current state, right? Whether it was current. So that's, that's the big thing. MLA, an MLA paper doesn't have subheadings. An APA head paper has subheadings. And again, the idea is in the humanities, things flow. And in the sciences, you just want to skip through something to get to the most important part. Okay? An MLA uh, is only a need for an abstract if, it's, if your work is going to be published. So you don't have to worry about the abstract piece. An APA it's coming out of the sciences mostly, so they think there's going to be some experiments and maybe things will be published, and so they expect an abstract. Um, another thing is that in MLA, the idea is that it's literature lives forever, right? So when you're talking about what somebody says in literature, it's in the present tense. So you would say Smith says, and then paraphrase it or have a quote. In APA, it's all kind of like, I'm just telling you what I found in the books. So it's Smith said. So those are kind of the difference. Okay. So overall, MLA requires just a main body and then a works cited page, right? But there's kind of variations within the discipline. So a humanities paper might be a little different than an English paper. Uh, and professors and editors uh can make their own rules so if you have any questions about what you're supposed to do just ask nobody's going to mind it's kind of the same thing in apa the rules vary according to the editors and the publishers and the the professors but usually apa has a title page um an abstract a main body and a reference page but again it kind of varies from the disciplines and if you have any questions, ask. Okay, so usually I find MLA easier, like right off the bat. This, there's a few things that are tricky, but for the most part, it's got fewer moving parts. In MLA, the in-text citation's always in the same place. In APA, the in-text citation slides around. So let's start with MLA. You like my penguin? Okay. <laughs> So, uh, most MLA papers have two sections. 
there's the main body and then the references. Okay, the main body, there's no title page, and the main body has like a heading that's up on the top left hand side. Um, it's double spaced, so it'll have your name and the class and the date, and it's just kind of that type of information, and then a centered title. Um, the reference part is called a works cited page. Some people will say they want an M a title page in MLA. And if they say that to you, then ask them what they want or just assume they want APA. But usually you don't have to worry about a title page. All right, so the title page information is at the top of page one. That's what I just said. And you put that in, you put your title, and then you just start typing. Make sure it's double spaced, make sure you indent your paragraphs, and you're probably not going to have subheadings. Okay? So that's what it looks like. See? Gotcha. It's real straightforward. In fact, for me, MLA is just just kind of basic, right? Um, see how it's indented and double spaced? This runs down a little bit to the bottom. That should be about an inch margin at the bottom. Uh, that last name and the page number needs to be way up in the top near the edge of your paper in the margin up there. And to do that on Word, you hit insert and header, and then you can do that. Okay, real straightforward. And there's what the body looks like. Okay, on the works cited page in MLA, you center the word works cited, you double space with hanging indents. And if you don't know what that is, I'll show you on the next example. Uh, the date location is usually at the end of the citation. The major letters in titles gets capitalized. Um, there's a place for editor and, uh, excuse me, edit and volume numbers. You alphabetize and you end each entry with a period. So let me show you, okay? This is a crazy woman here. But, okay, see the top, up in the top right corner there? You still have the ongoing heading that's with the page number, right? It says work cited, centered. And then each one of your citations has a hanging indent. See that second citation down where it says Kunt, Stephanie, and then not much sense in those census numbers, right? Yes. That way that it's indented, that's called a hanging indent. That's probably the most common mistake that students make. And I think it might be just because they don't know how to do it. So if you don't know how to do it, just like everything else in Word, there's like 500 ways to do everything. But you can just highlight everything, make sure that your ruler is showing, and then move the bottom triangle on the ruler in, and that will make the indent happen. Okay. Um, the um, see how the major books, in this case, was an uncommon thing, a common threads. Go well here, here. Uncommon threads in reading and writing about contemporary America. See how big book are put in italics where like stories or chapters or articles within books are put in italic in uh, quotation marks see? <laughs> now, this if i didn't know this after like doing it forever and i was on your side of the screen i would probably be freaking out right now because it just looks like there's so many rules <laughs> and there are so many rules and nobody knows these rules. I don't know all the rules. They change every three years. They don't often seem to make sense. They, they are sensible, but just from back, looking back, they don't seem like they make sense. The trick is to always just go to a source and look it up and kind of be willing to ask questions and figure out where things are. Okay. Mrs. Lewis, I have a question. Yeah. Sure. On that last screen that you just had, uh -huh. you cited where the picture came from. Is that what that was? Is that where you got that? This down courtesy? here at the bottom. Yes. Yeah. And so I'm trying to be a good a good person, and I'm putting citations on where I got the examples. Okay. Right? So if we yeah. were doing a slideshow, should our pictures be referenced like that on our slideshow? They should be. You should have pictures. Pictures should always be referenced. Um, 
there are fewer rules about how to do that. And in fact, when I was doing my PowerPoint, I was trying to figure out how to do it. It is also perfectly legit to do like a um, work cited page or a reference page that's called images at the end of your paper. Um, and a lot of people will do that. Um, to be on the safe side, if I were a student, I'd probably do both. Just, just to cover my bases. Because um, you can see this image is um, thing courtesy of MLA Works Cited page, Lumen Learning 2019. This yes. thing down at the bottom here, it's not everything that you'd need if you were doing a citation. It's just enough to kind of give people a sense of it. That makes sense. Thank you. Right. Cool. All right, so here are some samples. Um, so if you're trying to figure out how to, like, you know, I got this source. I have no idea how to cite it. Uh, a couple of things. Don't go to the bottom of the source where it says this is the MLA or this is the APA citation and trust that. Um, don't use that. Uh, a couple of reasons. One is it's more than likely out of date because there aren't librarians who are updating all of the citations on like a database. So that's number one. Number two, often the, the publishers don't really care about MLA and APA. What they're caring about is that they're covering their liability issues. So they'll say like copyright, which isn't even part of MLA and APA, right? So get that information to use it, but don't assume that format's correct. You wanna go to a citation and I have some, a, a source, um, and I have some, a couple slides down. And you need to say, okay, I am now looking at an article in a journal, or I am now looking at a book, or this is an electronic source. And then when you go to your guide, MLA or APA, and you look up under those categories, and it'll give you the breakdown, like an article in a journal with two authors or an article in a journal with an editor, right? So but that's the way to do it. Don't just go to the guides and expect to see things kind of laid out that in a way that would make sense to you. Okay. Okay. So in-text citations in MLA. The date in the in-text citation. Um, not, excuse me. I said the date and that's because I'm thinking APA. It should say the page, right? Notice that at the top there where it says the date in in-text citation. It should say the page. Right? So Byrne explains, because this is MLA, it's in the present tense. And then I have a quote, and that 199 is the page number. And the period goes to the right of the final parentheses. And so here's the logic. I'm reading along on your paper, and I come to this great quote, and I say, oh, I need to know where to find that. And so then I can go to your works cited page, and I will look up burn in the alphabetical list. And once I find that, I know I can find this quote right on page 199. Okay. Um, again, I got this as APA, so it should say the page. Goes at the end of the quote in the general in-text citation if their name is not in the text. So see in the one above, it says burn explains. <laughs> in the one below, it says he writes. So the author's reader might not know that we're talking about burn. So the in-text citation has burned. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yes. yes. Yeah, yes. okay. Um, yeah. Um, the, now, the big question is, what happens if you're an online source and there isn't a page number? And I don't have a good answer. And MLA will probably come out with a new edition in like, you know, four years and have the right answer to that. And we'll be on to something different. Um, if you don't put any number there, there are professors who will think you didn't know you were supposed to. And that worries me. Some will let it slide and some will assume that you're not doing your job. So a couple of strategies you can use. Um, one that MLA likes is to type P-A-R, all lowercase, like seven, right? So that's there's no page number, but it was paragraph seven. That's, that's an option. Okay. You could say table, 
22 or illustration six, right? Just the idea is that there's something people can go to, right? Um, if none of that works for you and you didn't flip away, I'd just say a one because it's page one. I mean, you know, like <laughs> I'd put something there just because you don't know how your professor is going to react. And you can ask, you can say to your professor, you know, if this is online, what do you want? And that might be the safest thing, but you're probably not going to go wrong having some number there. I'll make it up though. Okay. All right. So for paraphrases, um, right? Most of your papers should not be quotes. Papers should mostly be paraphrasing and they should sort of slide together. Um, the sources page page goes at the end of the paraphrase if the author's name is in the text, which is just like a quote. According to Byrne, toddlers may become upset because they aren't totally verbal yet. Anybody who has a toddler knows that's true, right? So then it's 199, right? So that wasn't a quote, and we said Byrne in the text, so Byrne doesn't have to go in the parentheses, right? Um, in the next one, it's also a paraphrase, and Byrne found toddlers may become upset, right? So it's the same type of content, just laid out a different way. You've said burn, so you don't need to put it in the in-text citation. But if you, if you aren't referencing, referencing the author and you are saying just toddlers may become upset because they aren't totally verbal yet, just put burn 199 right there in the in-text citation. Okay? Um, one of the things that's really important in both MLA and APA is if you're doing a quote, make sure you transition into that quote. It used to be, and we're talking only like five years ago, that you could have a paper that was sort of lots of quotes all put together. Um, and it was up to the reader to kind of string them so that it made sense. Now you have to say, according to Byrne, scholars believe, you know, it is probably the case according to so-and-so, right? You need to have, if you're going to do a quote, you need to slide into it so the reader's not confused. That's not true of a paraphrase. In the paraphrase, you can do it like the bottom there. Okay. All right. Any APA things jump out before I hop into a APA? Any MLA things drop out before I do APA? No, I'm okay. No? We're good? Okay. What are you, are you both thinking MLA or APA? What's your focus? Um, both. Both? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm um, doing for APA. I am okay. currently in biology, so he, uh, oh, we have to turn okay. in our presentation for, Okay. yeah, so I'm yeah. just looking at APA. Yeah. Okay, that's good, that's good. All right, so APA has four main sections. Like I said, APA, for me, probably because I came, I started with it, MLA, it's, it's, it's harder for me. But APA requires a title page, an abstract, main body, and then the references. Okay. okay. So in APA, you have the page header. Remember in MLA, it was just your name and the number. In APA, there's something called a running head. It's in the same area in the top of the margin, right? Mm -hmm. You put the numbers in flush right all the way on the right. Then you type the title of your paper in the header in the left using all capital letters and 12 point font. All right, and it's a shortened version. I know I have examples here. Okay, see that? Okay, yeah. That's what it looks like on your title page. All right. Okay. But just for clarification, it doesn't have to say running head. Is that just for example purposes, correct? It has to say running head. Oh, it does? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the logic, yeah, that. That's a good question. The logic is that if I were, and a lot of this logic goes back to like 40 years ago, if I were a professor and editor and I was looking through your work, I would see that you were identifying this is the running head. This is the thing that will be on every page. So okay. when I'm on page 10 of your paper, I can still tell it's you. Okay. 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 All right. So then that's how the, the center of it looks. Right, so there's a, and this is the Purdue Online Writing Lab sample. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. All right, on the next page, whoa, I went backwards. 
Okay. On the next page, you center the word abstract. On the next line, you write a summary of your work, and it's a paragraph of about 150 to 250 words. You double space. When I was writing my dissertation, I spent more time on that 250 words than I probably spent on 30 pages. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, kind of like, it's like, this is what I was doing. Um, that paragraph should have your research topic, the questions, participants, if you're like doing a study, methods, results, data analysis, and research implications all in like half a page. Um, you can also put keywords at the bottom of the abstract so that if it gets published, um, the person coding it will know how it can be found on Google or something. Mm -hmm. I'll show you what that looks like. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so see how it says now it's not running head on the page two. It just says Purdue on my lighting sample title page. See you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. On the first page it said running head and now it doesn't. Okay. Gotcha. Right. And then it says abstract, and this is all just Latinate junk. But um, that's about the length that it would be, and you're just kind of summarizing it. If you have to do an abstract, I would go online and kind of look up the word abstract and see some samples. Because then, you, once you have something to model, you can. Mm -hmm. and then down at the bottom where it says see, it says keywords. Those would be clear things that if someone was doing a search. The APA always assumes everything's published, um, which is interesting. Okay, so in the main body, you center your title again, and then you just start typing. Be sure that you indent your paragraphs and use double spacing. And the difference is that in APA, there are headings and subheadings. And I didn't want to go, we have an hour here, so I didn't want to go into the details of that, but the the headings kind of move inward as they go. You can have subheadings and sub subheadings. It gets really, it can get really complicated. But most most students who are freshmen, sophomores, even juniors are not writing things that need much more than just maybe. Okay, so that's how it looks, right? Um, and you can see this. This was the the uh, College of Western Idaho that I got this from they had the outline of the paper on there. So don't assume that's a margin, right? So see how they have the same thing. They have that title that probably in the full length of this would have said running head and then that, and then yeah. the full title of the paper. And then it's, right, all of this information. And then if you have a head subheading, they go centered like that where it says internal headings. And then the next level goes out to the full far left. You're probably not going to need much more than that. Okay. 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 So on the reference page, you center the word references, you double space again with hanging indents. And when I'm showing you the page, note the date location and the capitalization, and then things like the edit edition, alphabetize appropriately, and end each entry with a period. So here it is. Okay. Look at that. Okay. So I, I kind of closed in on it. See, it still has hanging indents, just like MLA. It has references instead of works cited. It's still alphabetized, but notice where the date is. The date is always in parentheses right after the author's name. So okay. that's, the, and you can see, that's kind of that logic. APA is focused on the sciences and business. So they're like, when was this last published? Mm -hmm. And MLA is like, it's all good. <laughs> you know, we'll just put it at the end. Um, we're, we're kind of fruity like that, okay? Um, in MLA, the major letters on titles get capitalized, right? Mm -hmm. In APA, see that article name? It says the quality of online social relationships. If that was MLA, that would have quotation marks around it, but the major words would still have capitals. In APA, there's no quotation marks, but it's lowercase. And that's how you can tell in APA. And then the major works are just like they are in MLA. They're italicized and everything that's important is capitalized, right? The, um, the, 
they do these funny volume and issue number things with uh, like, you know, 45 and then the parentheses around seven for that first one, Cummings. Um, I always have to look that up. You know, I've got stuff published in APA and I have to look it up because I can never remember how to do that. So I'll show you how to look that up in a sec. Okay, so here's kind of some samples of references, just like I showed you in, a, in MLA. In a journal, see it's Byrne, KL, and then the date, and then childhood development would be the name of the article or the chapter within it, and then current directions of psychological science, that's the name of the big publication. You know, like mm -hmm. if you've heard of this like, article within Time Magazine, and that's like the Time Magazine. 10 is the issue number, and then six to 10 is the range of pages, okay? In a book, book's pretty easy, um, but it looks like the old MLA. So you have, this, you have the city where it was published, colon, and the publication company. Um, and then electronic sources, same type of thing. You can always say where you got it. Okay, now. Here's the in-text citations. And this is the part that in APA is a little trickier. So according to Byrne, and the date goes in parentheses closest to the author's name, mm -hmm. wherever that author's name is. So according to Byrne, 2012. And then we have the quote. And at the end of it, they say page 199, right? Mm -hmm. If this was MLA, it would be we wouldn't worry about the date and it would just say 199 at the end, right? Um, in the next one, Byrne found, right? And so the 2012 goes next to his name, right? Uh, if you don't include the, his name in your text, like according to Byrne, if you just say he wrote, Byrne goes in the in-text citation and the date always goes next to his name. No matter where it is, it goes next to the name, right? So if you're reading a P MLA, the date kind of is consistently at the end of things. If you're reading APA, the date shifts around. You're going to have just wherever the name is. If you don't have a name of an author in both MLA and APA, like you sometimes get in online sources, you just put the name of the work that it came from you know, I don't know, Smithsonian Magazine, according to Smithsonian Magazine, 2020. And then you go into your quote. Okay. 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 Uh, here are some paraphrases. And in APA, just like MLA, you want to have more paraphrases than quotes. All right. So according to Byrne, 2012, and then it's not a quote, and you just put the page number at the end. Same thing, burn 2012 found. It's not a quote, right? And then the last one, if you didn't put his name, Burns' name in your text, it goes at the end, burn 2012, page 199. Right? Okay. There. So nobody remembers this stuff. Seriously, I mean, I get <laughs> students who feel like overwhelmed and dumb because they don't know it. Nobody does. Um, and, and I want to make it clear, APA and MLA are not making a lot of money on this. That's not the goal. People who make the money are the publishers who interpret what MLA and APA are doing. They're just trying to keep up with changing technology. Just, what, about six years ago, MLA said that we shouldn't trust anything online. Um, you know, and now libraries are online. So, <laughs> particularly during the last what, month. Um, and so, you know, I mean, things are changing so rapidly. They're just trying. Okay. So then ways to find this stuff. If you go to the college's website and you go to the library page and you go to the find it link, you will get this, this page, right? It will drop down and their citation format. And if you click there, you get four options. They're all good. Um, you can go this route to get to it. You can also just type into Google OWL plus 
MLA or OWL plus APA, and that's L-O-W-L, and you'll get to the Purdue OWL website. They do a fantastic job, and there's a link to that on the college's library page too. Um, they do a, a fantastic job. The uh, Purdue University actually has graduate students who are paid to keep it running. And so it's up to date and it's always good. Um, and it gives examples. So that's a really good place to start. Okay, good luck. So do you got any questions? Anything that stands out? <laughs> no questions, it was very important. Um, Dr. Lewis? Yeah. Sorry, um, I have a question. I'm doing a presentation for biology with my classmate and we have to turn it into um, the LFC, LFCC information literacy. And it has, I know it has to be an APA, but my partner and I were like really worried because um, our professor told us to put the paragraphs underneath the notes. So we've been doing everything as much as we can, but it's difficult to adapt the APA format, especially doing PowerPoints and stuff. So I don't know if because we do have a reference um, pages at the very end. Um, we're trying okay. to do it, but I don't know if it's going to be good enough. I don't know if there's a like, specific way we can make sure we don't get in trouble. Okay, yeah. So, um, so all right. So, the getting into trouble. Let me address getting into trouble. Okay. Um, the college's honor policy has plagiarism as the intentional or unintentional theft of another person's ideas. And it's that unintentional thing that knocks people for a loop because you know in the hardest reading of that if somebody said you know you messed up on a period that's unintentional theft um there are not too many people who are gonna who are gonna take care do it that way um for the most part if you give a good shot and you do you know the hanging and dents and you have a good reference page and all of that you'll be fine if you have images on a PowerPoint, um, then if you do like a little, you know, you do a text box and you put just a, a hint of where it is, so that image could be found on a alphabetical listing under images, um, that covers that. Okay, um, great. If you have notes and you do like the clear in-text citation on your notes, that covers that. Okay. Um, you know, you can ask your professor if he or she believes that there should be in-text citations on your PowerPoint. Um, to be safe, I would probably do it. Um, but I would ask because that does the power, the, there isn't much verbiage on a slide and you yes. hate to pick up your slide with in-text citations, you know, yeah. um, but ask but ask what, what the thinking is. Um, okay. um, I can tell you when I did my dissertation, um, I had to do a defense of it where you sit with the committee and you, you talk them through the paper and you tell them mm -hmm. how to do it. And, um, and I, yeah. Um, and so for that, I did not do in-text citations for my PowerPoint, but I had a clear, and that was in APA. I had a clear reference page and I had a clear images page and all my notes had in-text citations. Okay, great. Um, so for that audience, it was good enough. I would still send your professor a question just to make sure um, because it's a pretty formal, important thing that you're doing. Um, okay. Yeah, but... Um, Generally, there's an understanding if you've made a good shot at it, if you have a reference page or a works cited page or whatever, and as much as makes sense you've cited, you're good. Okay, thank you so much. I will add though, we don't have the reference, the Im, like a reference page for the images, so we're definitely going to do that. Just yeah. uh, do it, call it, call it reference, call it images centered, okay. and then um, if you go to um, the Owl Purdue site for APA, there'll be a place where it says um, uh, images. It's on the other, you know, like it's not electronic, oh, okay. it's yeah. not journals, right? There's a place. Um, and generally, generally what happens is they, they say you know, they want the photographer and then they want the 
um, the name of the image, and then they want who's the production company. Like, and there's all this stuff, and the chances are good you're not going to have any of it. So, um, because how often have you looked at a site that said the name of the the photographer? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just not there. So um, you just skip that, okay. right? Um, one of the things, if you were trying to do images commercially, like for a company, you would have to get permission from the, the um, let's say you got a job and you were doing PowerPoint presentations for, I don't know, some manufacturing company, right? right. Any images that weren't done by the company in-house, if you went out online and found images, you would have to have the permission of the company and or the photographer before you could use them in a commercial setting. Um, okay. okay, so it's the, the bar is really high for that. Um, in education, it is, the bar is much lower, right? Okay. Um, so you, you tend to be, that's why in all of this presentation, I cited everything because it's for you guys and it's education, it's password protected, nobody's going to be publishing this. But yes. if I were saying, oh, I'm going to sell this and make a bunch of money, I'd be going to all of those various images, including the penguin people, and <laughs> saying, you know, I need, I need where you, I need your permission. Okay. Um, I, yeah. But you don't need to worry about it for this, for education. Just, I wanted to give you a heads up so that if you were in the workforce, you didn't get in major a future problems. reference. Thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Lewis. Uh, I appreciate welcome. it. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. I appreciated this lot. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye.